will be Kate Logan, who is the director of the film Kidnapped for Christ. Her film, um, she's been working on it for six years, and um, she's just got a, an amazing um, story behind the film. Um, really look forward to talking to her too. And then um, the directors of the, the film Surviving Straight Inc., Andrew Pinsner and Chris Arosa. And I, I know Chris Arosa is the director, and I think Andrew is, his official title I think is assistant director, but I'm, I'm not sure. Um, and I know Andrew's going to be on the show, and um, Chris had to get off work, so I didn't confirm with him directly. But Chris, if you're listening, I sure hope you can get off work and talk on the radio. Um, I'm really excited to have these um, two on the show because I've um, gotten to know them in the last year or so working on the film, and they are two of the hardest working young people that you'll ever meet. Um, um, well, two of the hardest, I shouldn't describe them as young people. Um, two of the hardest pe working, pe hardest working people you'll meet. They like would go 18, 20 hours without sleeping and just always on the go and never a negative word, just always positive, always communicating so well, just such an inspiration. And um, all three, all, all four of these directors will all be at the uh, SIA convention, Survivors of Institutional Abuse. Um, and so I'll get to meet Nick and Kate in person for the first time. And um, about going to the SIA, uh, this will be the first gathering all the program survivors be the first time that everybody's invited. Uh, excuse me, Marcus. Yeah. I'm sorry, but your sound keeps fading in and out. Um, it may be as simple as a Skype connection, so I'm going to hang up and just call you instantly back. Okay. Okay, thank you. Hang in there, folks. A uh, little Skype glitch, but that's to be expected. We'll get Marcus right back in here. And maybe that'll clear that up uh, before we get... There you go, you're back with us. Okay. It, yeah, um, it clear now. Great. Okay, good. Um, yeah, all my guests will be calling in on the telephone. So um, hopefully that'll help things as far as the technical side of things. Um, so um, I'm, I'm just going to assume everybody heard all that stuff. Uh, is it... Kevin, is there anything in particular that I what that might not be clear from where I faded out? Uh, no, I think they could hear you, but I, I okay. wanted to stop it before it gets worse because it usually doesn't go away on its own, and many times it's just a matter of reconnecting. Um, okay. And I just wanted to touch base with you because we didn't have a lot of time to talk. Are you in the chat room now, Marcus? Where because I know you had mentioned um, that you've got a lot of information and you'd like any questions presented to the chat room and you'll pick them up and address them as you can. Is that still the plan? Yeah, that's still the plan and um, I, I guess for this show I would like to just really let my guests have all the time um, and that's just my thinking offhand and of course I'm open to something if something else comes up um, and questions that are on the chat room, I could try to answer maybe next show or answer the person directly on the chat room. Um, but I don't trust my technical skills to follow questions and listen to my guests at the same time. Sure. Okay. So maybe just um, if, if it's a real question, uh, reach out to you um, through one of your other contact means. But other than that, just today would be a good day for people to take their own notes and absorb information. Yeah, and, and I mean, if, if somebody's listening and they really, really, really want to say something, I would say go ahead and call in. I'm sure my guests would be happy to hear from people. I am, in all of this, I'm hesitant to sort of make it be a certain way. Um, sure. 
Well, so, yeah, we're, we're flexible. I mean, you'll know your time limit, and if we get to the end of the show and there's time and uh, you've hit all the bases, then, you know, we'll just go ahead. Um, you lead the ship, and, and we'll open the doors where we need to. Uh, not a problem at all. So, you know, for the listeners, but it, for the people out there that are listening, uh, maybe on StreamFinder or through Winamp or other places, please come to humanbeingbroadcasting.net. Right in front of you, uh, around the center of the page, you will see uh, show titles. Uh, just simply click the one that says Op Liberation. That will bring you into the Op Liberation room um, where you can see their sponsors and their supporters uh, inside that chat room. And you can chat with uh, people uh, you know, about the show. And if there are any links that get placed in there, you can pick those up and do some research. So make sure you come over to the website and interact with the people. Um, yeah, and uh, so Marcus, if if your guests need to be called, we can also call them in. I I don't know if you were aware of that. So yeah, um, I I think they're all gonna just call in, and if um, if somebody doesn't call in, then um, we can we can try to call them. I uh, I I I just told Nick that when it seems like the natural time to call in, go ahead and call in. So. Um, you should be calling any minute, I reckon. I just wanted to give a little introduction, so I feel like I've done that. Although, let's see, I was introducing the SIA convention. And, um, well, yeah, my plug for that is it'll be the first time that all program survivors from all the different programs, religious programs, drug rehabs, all survivors of institutional abuse are invited. I know that there's... Well, I know there's at least 80, and I want to say there's 90 now, but there's going to be a lot of people there. And um, I think it's so important for, um, I just think it's so healing to connect with people, um, other survivors of these programs, because it's so easy to feel alone in, in your experience, because if you just try to describe a behavior modification program or um, a thought reform program, it's easy to uh, you know, feel like you're describing an alien culture or something, you know. Um, so it's really nice to just be understood and um, I think it's really important to build this solidarity um, is in, in raising public awareness of what goes on in these programs. Um, I've been reading um, Alexia Park's book, American Gulag, and um, it's just so amazing how similar the programs are in the methods that they use to change people. And um, well, I forgot what I was going to say because I just looked down at my computer and I saw that. Well, that doesn't matter. Um, let's see. I'm gonna. I'm sorry, everybody. I'm doing my technical. I'm gonna close my computer screen windows. So, oh, so Jody just sent me a message and said over 90 people have registered so far for the SIA convention. That um, is awesome. Um, yeah. And Marcus, I just want to put out there for the people that are new to the website and don't know, when you go to the Op Liberation Room, um, there is also links to SIA uh, and a donate button. If you can help support them or you want more information to register, Marcus has taken the space that it was available to him to use um, as being a host here. Everybody gets their own little space, and he used his space to support SIA. So um, if you can help him in that, please find your way to the Op Liberation Room and see the, I believe it's in the left-hand corner, um, the uh, links to uh, see us so you can help support them or get more information about their conference coming up. Yeah, it's. I'm getting super excited. I guess it's like 10 days from now. And, uh, I'm super excited about it. 
And, and uh, actually, uh, Marcus, just so you know, at some point later on when you need a break, or if you need a break, we'll, we'll run that uh, commercial for uh, Jody and Sia as well that I have um, for their convention. So we'll, we'll mix that in during your break time if you want. Okay. Um, well, I guess, uh, let's see. I, yeah, I'm learning this lesson, Kevin. I think, Nick, if you're listening... Um, I'm, I'm totally done with my introduction. Um, I had told him that last week we had technical difficulties for the first part of the show, and I wanted to make sure we didn't um, just sort of waste, uh, well, like Jody and I had to go over stuff twice. So. Um, anyway, I told Nick just to call when it seemed like the right time. Okay, and we did have a call just come in and join you, Marcus. Okay, okay. Hello? <clears throat> Hello, is that Nick? Is it? Yeah, it's Nick. How are you? Nick Alia. Uh, all right, I'm so glad you're here. I'm good. How are you doing? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Um, just so our listeners know, this is Nick Alia. Um, director of Over the GW, Aaron Baker, and your new film is going to be Altered States of Plane, but it's not been released yet, right? Yeah, no, we just uh, wrapped up uh, post-production, and uh, the interesting thing about that film, it, it, it isn't directly related to uh, teen torture camps or institutionalized child abuse or anything like that, but I will say after making it and showing it to some people, um, they're like, okay, this is kind of a fictionalized, esoteric uh, insight into um, my, your PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, from coming out of uh, your own programs. And I never really thought of it that way before, but I, I guess it's true. Yeah. Uh, the movie's about yeah, a I guy. Got... Oh, sorry. Yeah, the movie's about a guy uh, named Emmanuel Plain. Uh, uh, he falls asleep and he wakes up in different parts of the world and uh, he doesn't know why and he's looking for answers. Uh, uh, but his symptoms and what, what he goes through in, in his head is, uh, you know, I think a lot of people who have come out of uh, what I came out of uh, could, could really relate to it. So, Yeah, when I read about the film, I, I, I thought there was some insight there because it reminded me of like, you know, the memory suppression and then the memory recovery. And there's this, like, you know, all of a sudden you remember this big chapter of your life from being in a program. And I, I think a lot of people, it is sort of like waking up in a new, <laughs> a new world almost to have the uh, traumatic memories recovered. Also, Emmanuel, he... Uh he was an orphan. He doesn't know a lot about his past or his parents. Um, and uh, so he was in and out of orphanages and, uh, and foster homes uh, and even uh, mental institutions his entire life. And uh, he, he was abused there. So he has this fear of going back there, of being yeah. trapped in this institution. And, yeah. and he has this condition where he falls asleep and he wakes up in other parts of the world, but nobody believes him. He has nobody to turn to. He's saying, this is what's wow. going on with me, and nobody will believe what I'm saying. And they, they, they think, and they're calling me a liar, and they're, they're doing this to me in there and that to me in there, and I just want answers, and I just want to find out who I, I really am and why. And I think a lot of people could relate to that. I mean, that's something I went through coming out of the program. I, I was in a... You know, for people who don't know my background, I was in a place called Kids of North Jersey in the late 90s for two and a half years. And uh, it was ran by uh, Miller Newton. And um, I eventually had to escape to get out of there. But, um, yeah, I don't know. It's just... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and your the the film over the GW is based on your personal story, right? Yeah, I uh, it it started with my experiences in kids, but I didn't stop there in my writing 
in my research. I, 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 I went online, I spoke to people, I, I want to know about other people's stories, other people's uh, experiences. Um, I want to know about other programs. What, was this something that was unique to uh, what I went through and the other people that are in the program with me went through, or is it a bigger issue? And I, I found out, uh, scary enough, I, I found out that uh, it, it is in some ways a global issue. Yeah. It wasn't just this one little rehab uh, in New Jersey, which yeah. I, you know, which I thought of at the time. So, in in sculpting the film, the protagonist doesn't just represent me, but he's more of a composite of a lot of different people and personalities yeah. um, that that I've encountered. And the program that I designed in the movie has a lot of the nuances of kids and straight, but I tried to incorporate some of the, uh, the details and idiosyncrasies you could find in, in uh, a lot of these other programs as well to, uh, you know, so, so, you know, people from uh, Family Foundation or this place or WASP could watch it and be like, okay, that's my story as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that, so that, that, that was very, uh, that was very important to me in, in yeah. making that one. And also in my research, uh, I read a book called, uh, an incredible book called Help Enemy Cross by Maya Salovitz. And um, first of all, if anybody hasn't read that book, I'd uh, implore them to go pick it up right away and read it. Um, mm. But secondly, I, I, there's this one story in there. It's, uh, uh, the book is on the tough love industry and it follows four true stories and one of them is a kid named Aaron Bacon. He, uh, he was put in a wilderness camp in the mid-90s by his parents to cure him of drugs and alcohol. And when they found this camp, they thought, you know, they thought it was going to be like a resort. He was going to be hiking in the beautiful Utah deserts by day, campfires by night. And what was going on was the exact opposite. The second they got him in there, the uh, uh, some some of the staff members were molesting the boys. You know, these these weren't people with uh, uh, clinical degrees, and uh, he he was tortured and starved so bad that after only being there for thirty days, he died. And if you were to see a picture of what he looked like at the end of those 30 days he was emaciated. I'm talking worst of the worst elsewhere. And throughout this 30 days he was complaining to the staff members. He was saying there's something wrong with me. I need to see a doctor. Yeah. I, I, I need help. And they would turn to him and they'd be like you're a faker. You're lying keep on going yeah. and he died. So I think in, in these programs and in these situations, I mean, and that's something that's not unique to him. I mean, I, I experienced that too. I, I was uh, sexually assaulted and uh, I had no one to turn to either. And I know a lot of people could relate to stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, I, I do think that in a healthy program or a healthy facility, there should, no matter what, no matter what, even if you think the kid is faking, you have an intuition or whatnot, they should be treated as if they're telling the truth and they have a real problem and should see a real doctor no matter what and let it come out later that they may have been lying or faking or something as opposed to the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... That's such a sad story. I just, um, I feel so much, um, well, I just, just the hugeness of what his parents must go through. Um, I just, you know, it's like we have the chance to heal. And uh, it's just, um, ah, it's a little overwhelming to um, 
really try to imagine what that would be like. And um, well, in his program, Nick, were the staff people, did they themselves go through that program or they were they kind of like minimum wage workers who didn't get training? Do you, do you know the details about the staff people? Yeah, sure. Um, they, they, they did not go through the program. They were pe people, they were, they were kids themselves, older kids, but they were kids uh, uh, over 18 years old, hired off the street, who kind of knew a lay of the land because they were going on hiking expedi expeditions. And uh, I think the other, for any parents who are listening right now and have a kid who's doing drugs and they're looking for a program for them, I think another thing you need to watch out for is A, if the staff members are kids who went through the program, and B, if the staff members are just people hired off the street and they don't have master's degree, master degrees or higher. I think those are, are two big red flags right there. Yeah. Um, let's see, what else can I say? So, to go on with my story, so when I was in there, I knew nobody on the outside world knew what was going on. I knew my parents didn't really know what was going on. I knew uh, the law enforcement really didn't know what was going on because in my head, if people knew what was going on, how could this place exist? Right. And uh, so when I got out, I was like, I need to do something about this so people know what was going on so uh, future future generations of kids aren't affected the way we were. How long and did it, how long was it before you started working on the film, between getting out of the program, how long was it before you started working on the film? On the I, I, I'll put it to this way, even when I was in the program, I was like, I need to make a film about this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. you could say I started working on it when I was 14. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, they told me, because I was into filmmaking even before I went, to, even before I went in the program, and they told me that the film industry is a druggy industry, and I couldn't be a filmmaker if I wanted to be sober. They said, "Yeah, I needed to dedicate my life to their program, work there for the rest of my life, restrain kids on the floor if I wanted to be sober." They <laughs> said. Yeah, it operated like a cult. And so even after I escaped, I so badly wanted to be sober and I was so scared to go back to using drugs that I tried to live my life by the way they taught me to be sober. Mm -hmm. And it didn't work and I ultimately went back to using more drugs. One, because I was numbing the pain I went through when I was in there. Two, because I was very, very confused about who I was. They were telling me who I was mm -hmm. as opposed to encouraging and inspiring me yeah. to find it out for myself. Yeah. And so eventually when I really did get sober, it was because I had to ask myself, who, who am I? What are my loves? What are my passions? What inspires me? What is this void I'm trying to fill with these drugs? And you know, what, what, are, what are my loves? And, you know, filmmaking is a passion of mine. Telling stories through a visual medium, you know, is, is my passion. And uh, I, I got sober. I, I locked myself in a room for six months. And I got sober. And then I decided, and then I asked myself, what do I want to do with my life? Well, I remember back to when I was a kid, I was always passionate about filmmaking. So I, I went to film school. And uh, the second I enrolled in there, I was like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Wow. And, and from there, I, I've been sober uh, eight and a half years now wow. on my own terms. And um, what film school did you go to? I briefly went to Hunter College in New York City and uh, went there for a couple semesters and then I realized 
it was taking too long for me to get to the things I really wanted to learn because there were all these prereqs you had to take. So I, I took uh, the rest of my film school money and I went off and I, I made uh, GW. Uh -huh. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And is, you know, I know that you, I saw the testimony you gave on Capitol Hill and did that come as a result of your film? I mean, in my mind, I think your film was really instrumental in the whole GAO investigation, the Government Accountability Office investigation. I mean, did you, I think that is, and did you get invited to Capitol Hill to testify because of your film? Yeah, I think everything happened because of the film. Yeah, I, uh, it's... You know, I, even when I, was when I was making the film, you know, I was going through something that, and a lot of people I spoke to could relate to this. And this is part of the reason why I wanted to make the film. I was, before I made it, I'd never told any of my new friends what I went through when I was a kid because, A, I was ashamed about it, and B, I didn't understand it. Yeah. And I didn't want people to judge me. And that, but I did feel a strong need to make this film because I felt people needed to know what was going on in these programs. And like I yeah. said, I, when I was in there, I felt alone and I knew nobody knew what was going on in the outside world. Well, now I know somebody knows what's going on in the outside world and it's me. Yeah. And I don't want these kids that are in there now to feel alone. So I'm like, I, I need to do whatever I can to raise awareness. So I, I, I made the film, but even while I was making the film, I didn't tell any of the cast and crew that it was based on my story, partially because I was still very embarrassed and ashamed by it. So it was this weird dichotomy. It was, in one hand, I knew I needed to get the story out there, but on the other hand, I still wanted to keep my story very private. And then one of the actresses one day made a comment like, with the restraints, she was like, oh yeah, the, I, this would never happen in a rehab. And in that moment, I realized <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. And, and mind you, you've seen the movie. It, the, it really is the watered down version of what goes on in there. So, like, um, so she couldn't believe that. Anyway, yeah. so at that moment, I had the realization that I needed, as much as I didn't want to, I didn't like it, I, I needed to make it public that GW, this story, was based on my life and what I went through. So people knew that this is yeah. a real thing. And yeah. um, so I think from there, making that decision, that that's where all this other stuff came. Yeah. I, uh, uh, we, we premiered at the Slamdance Film Festival, and then from there we played, uh, we, we, we played around in theaters and select cities around the nation. And then after that, um, the, uh, the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, uh, reached out and, uh, you know, they got wind of the film and uh, they were using that as evidence. And then I was invited to go to Capitol Hill to speak. And uh, um, the thing I find inspiring is what I really wanted more than anything else is to inspire other people to speak out. I wanted yeah. to get kids who are suffering a voice and I wanted to say that if someone feels comfortable speaking out, it's okay. It's not that bad. Yeah. And uh, for me making the movie was a very uh, cathartic experience. I think it was one of the most healing things I, I've done for you know, my, my PTSD. Yeah, well, that's just an amazing story. Like, tell, I mean, I can just imagine telling the crew, and they're all working on this film, and then find out it's actually your story. Like, man, that's, that's just amazing. I remember, you know, one, one thing I'm curious about is the public reception or feedback you've gotten, because I remember when we talked before, you said that people who were in the program said, oh, yeah, you know, you really barely even scratched the surface and then people who had never weren't familiar with programs said oh I'm sure you over dramatized it you know I'm, I'm really curious like you know it I can imagine people having a hard time believing that that really goes on 
Yeah, the interesting thing with the uh, the straight and kids people specifically, they're like, yeah, that's what happened, but that's the watered down version. And um, but the one thing that I think is overlooked a lot when those comments are made is that uh, the movie was designed to relate to people who went to all types of programs. Yeah. And for as many of those straight and kids people who came out are like, yeah, that's the story, but it was much worse. Uh, there have been X amount, as many people to match that from other programs who didn't have the, the idiosyncrasies of the motivating or the this or the, or the that, who were right. like, that was my program. And right. to me, that's what I was going for. And, yeah, and I, think, I, I almost think sometimes uh, straighter kids people may not be aware that there are tons of other programs out there, slightly different, but with similarities, that also abuse people. And I think it's important for all these survivors to have a voice. Now, the other thing uh, um, to keep in mind is what... When we had a screening in New York for survivors, I remember there was one girl in the audience who, when she was in her program, she was in ARC up in Canada. Mm. And she used to dig into her hands and her legs so severely that, that they would bleed. And since she left the program, she hasn't done it once. And when she was watching the movie, without her realizing it, by the time the movie was over, her hands were all bloody. Uh, uh, so uh, if, I, if I were to make a film that was as shocking and disturbing, if I went all the way, I just feel yeah. like yeah. for survivors, yeah. it would just be too much to watch because of how yeah. re-stimulated they could be. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and for, the, for the actors. I mean, when we were doing the uh, reenactments down in Florida, you know, the actors were, were crying and, and traumatized by having to act it out, you know? I mean, part of me was kind of ambiguous, like, are we doing something unethical by asking these, this group of kids, these college kids, asking them to act this group therapy out? It was almost unethical just to act them, ask them to, you know, pretend, you know? It was so yeah, ab ab yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't think it was unethical for you to ask them, but yeah, I know, well, I know what you're saying. Yeah, um, just seeing their reaction, I mean... It was, uh, yeah, it wasn't unethical. It just brings that question up of like, and, and I have to say, and I feel like a schmuck, I can't watch your movie. Like the trailer of the kid in the intake room, I can't, I, I, I can't even watch the whole trailer. I have to turn it off. I can't, yeah. you know. I can't, I can't watch the movie either. I'm with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I don't feel so bad then. The other, thing I, the other thing I really wanted out of the movie, um, which I know I succeeded, is I wanted, because it, it's such, and, and Marcus, you know this uh, from you, uh, previous discussions you and I have had before, but the topic is so vast and intricate and there's so many layers to it that yeah. I could be talking for 12 hours and someone still may not understand. So I was just yeah. hoping that I could, I could take a movie and take 80 minutes and have something that other survivors could take to their uh, their significant others, their family, their parents and say, hey, yeah. this is kind of what I went through to help you understand. Yeah, and I know people are having that experience. Um, that's, yeah, I mean it's so frustrating to, uh, like you said, you could talk for 12 hours and still not really convey the reality of it and then to try to do it in a feature length film I mean it is it's like uh, what am I trying to say I'm saying uh, it's a challenge and but I know I've heard so many people say you know with over the GW two things one is 
that was a lot of people, you know, it triggered their whole memory recovery of that time in their life. And then the other I hear a lot is people do share it with their family, their therapist, and it's sort of like, look, see, you know, I wasn't making this up all along. And, and um, I, it's, I've heard so many people talk about over the GW as, as a really a, a turning point in their life, you know. Yeah, I, uh, I think it's important for not only us, but our support group and our, our loved, ones, loved ones around us to understand the dynamic of the program and what we went through. And I, I feel very uh, lucky that my girlfriend at the time, now my fiance, is the lead actress in the film. Wow. And she, like you said, where you took the actors and they had to experience for about a little time. It took us about six months to shoot the movie. And so for six months, my girlfriend had to live in the program. So uh -huh. even though she got to go home at night and uh, sleep in her own bed, she got to go through a complete story, beginning, middle, and end, through her art and her expression, her creativity, and experience what it was like in a safe manner, in a controlled and safe manner, mind you. But she was able to experience and go through what I experienced, and she was able to bring that, uh, um, that empathy and compassion and that understanding to the relationship. Yeah. That's like a survivor's dream to be understood on that level. I mean, I mean, man, that's just the most beautiful story. And she taught me, to go back to what we were talking about a little earlier, uh, I think without her realizing she was teaching me, she taught me uh, um, the biggest uh, uh, lesson I probably learned in life. And that was the lesson of unconditional love. When I realized that moment one day that I needed to tell the cast and the crew that this film was based on my story, I was scared shitless. Mm -hmm. I was so scared. And we were dating at the, Kether and I were dating at the time. Her name is Kether. And I told her first, we were walking home one night from the gym. And I was like, listen, there's something I really need to tell you here that you're not aware of. And I said, the movie, the thing we've been working on, that's based on my life story. And I thought she was just going to be disgusted in me. I thought she was going to turn her back on. All, all the worst yeah. fears you could possibly imagine. Yeah. I thought was going to come out and it was so interesting and therapeutic to me to see the look on her face after I went and opened this all up to her because she didn't even have a reaction. She was like, oh, thank God it's only that. I thought you were going to tell me you wanted to break up with me or something. <laughs> <laughs> It was, it was like, like if, if what I told her, the biggest thing for me in the world, in, in, in my mind, is this thing that I'm carrying around. She's like, oh, it's that? Okay, okay. I thought it was, we were going to say something else. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and that, that's what I think the first time in my life where I, it, I learned what the meaning of unconditional love is. And the next day, she picked me up from work. She surprised me. She was waiting right outside my job. And she was standing there with the biggest smile on her face. Oh. And, that, and that smile was as if, if, at that moment, it felt as if that was the first time anyone has ever smiled at me. Wow. Wow. It's almost like she really, really, it's like she knew you, you know? It's like, 
That's, I think that's one of the most painful things about going through one of these programs is how hard it is to really be known. Absolutely. And understood. Yeah. And, Man. And, 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 and love. And love. Yeah. So anyway, fast forward. So I've been sober for about eight years, a little over eight years. And... I think the biggest struggle in my uh, sobriety in my adult life has been dealing with the post-traumatic stress. Uh -huh. I would get the um, uh, wake up, sweat all over my body, the nightmares, fear uh, of uh, loss, fear of death depression at times, some days feeling the high of highs, and by the evening the low of lows, and it's like, what do you, what do, you do with that? And then I found this, uh, this thing last year called, uh, uh, a friend recommended it to me, it's called Transcendental Meditation. Have you ever heard of it? Um, I've heard of it, yeah. Anyway, um, I read about it in a book called uh, um, Catching the Big Fish by the filmmaker David Lynch. And I read the thing for the creative aspects of filmmaking. And he was also talking about something called TM or Transcendental Meditation as a way to access creativity. And I'm like, what, what, is, this, what is this meditation thing? Uh, and so I did more research into it, and uh, I read that the David Lynch Foundation, they give uh, TM to uh, war veterans who come back from the war with PTSD to help them out. And I'm uh, like, hmm, I wonder if this could be applied to me. So I learned how to do it, and at first I was very, very, very skeptical mm -hmm. coming out of what I went through when I was little in, in terms of... Uh, um, the treatment abuse and um, the place I was in operating like a cult or like Orwell's 1984. So anything that involves help, I'm always suspicious. Yeah. Um, and then I'm like, are they going to want to, I just want to learn how to do this. Are they going to try to suck me into something? And it could have been very rational or it could have been very irrational. I didn't know, but I had this paranoia, and to my, uh, to my surprise, it was just something that they teach you, you learn, you do it twice a day, and it's up to you to do it. People don't call me every day like, hey, get involved in this, or there's another course, or uh, we really want you to help out there. I, I never felt at any point that they were trying to suck me into something or, or brainwash me. It was here, we just taught you how to do it. Now it's up to you on your own time, in your own life, twice a day, if you want to meditate and uh, reap the benefits. And I, I can honestly say, I, I was very skeptical from the get-go, but after doing it for a, a couple of weeks, I noticed about 90% of my post-traumatic stress symptoms one away. Yeah. And that, um, hello? Oh, hi, this is Kate. Oh, hi, Kate. How are you? I'm well. How about yourself? I'm good. Um, let's see. I, I'm, I have to apologize for everybody for being, this is sort of an organic radio show. It's basically a, a big, uh, phone call. Um, so I didn't have exact set times for folks. I just said um, about uh, well. Anyway, um, I want to hear. I want to hear. Um, Nick um, is still talking about, about the transcendental. Yeah, let, let me finish up on my point, and then I'll, I'll let you uh, uh, go with uh, soar away with Kate. How's that sound? Yeah, I want to say something about meditation. Yeah, I want to say something about meditation too. And 
I don't know. Have you two met Nick and Kate? Uh, we have not. Nice to um, meet you, Kate. Yeah, Nick. Uh, she's going to be at the SIA convention, and um, I can't wait to... Um, I can't wait for you two to meet. She's got such an amazing story behind her film, Kidnapped for Christ. Awesome. I can't wait to meet you. Yeah, same, same to you. would love to see your film if you're able to bring a copy. Oh, we would love for it to be finished so that we could show it to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> I'll be patient. I'll wait. <laughs> Um, anyway, my point about the uh, the TM is uh, it was really instrumental in helping me with uh, my post traumatic stress. Yeah, and uh, I, I think what really made me understand uh, um, because it, it kind it kind of creeps in without you realizing it in terms of the uh, um, of the benefits. But like, one day my fiance turned to me and she was like, "I'm gonna tell all my friends' boyfriends to go do TM." So then I was like, "Okay, I know it's working." <laughs> yeah, that's a good sign. Yeah. So I got a laugh out of that. Yeah, I I had the same experience. I I don't meditate anymore, but I got really involved with uh, Zen Buddhism, and um, I I really felt like. It was working on a deeper level than any kind of talk therapy could. Like I, I really felt like it was, you know, getting to the unconscious uh, hardwiring. You know. Um, yeah, I will say what with, with I feel like with talk therapy, I feel like the benefits for me, the benefits are you learn about yourself. But when you're doing something like meditation or uh, 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 practicing Buddhism and stuff like that. I feel like when I'm doing TM, I feel like as opposed to learning about myself, I feel like I'm finding myself. And I feel like because I'm finding myself, I'm getting in touch with the universe. So I think that to me, that's the difference between the two. Yeah. Yeah, I need to start doing meditation again. I miss it. Just got really lazy. Anyway, um, um, Kate, it was very nice meeting you, and I look forward to meeting you in person uh, in a couple weekends. And Marcus, you, yeah. thank you so much. Yes. And Marcus, thank you so much thank for having me on the show, and I look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks as well. Yeah, thanks so much for, uh, for talking, Nick. And yeah, I can't wait to meet you in person. And uh, it's always great to talk. Take care, buddy. Okay, you too. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Um, everybody, my next guest is Kate Logan, who is the director of the film, upcoming film, Kidnap for Christ. Um, it is about a program called this in the Dominican Republic. And Kate has been working on her film for six years now. And um, she's got an amazing story of how this all came about. Um, I don't think she really knew what she was in for. Would you say that's true, Kate? When you when you first started, um, when you first got the idea oh, sorry, to make this I'm film, you didn't really. Oh, yeah. I'm saying. Uh, um. What? Are you there? Um, Are you there? So you're you're asking about yeah no I I can hear you now. Um, okay. So you're you're asking about how I first uh, came across the school and decided to make the film. Yeah, I was just saying uh, that I don't think you realized what you were signing up for when you decided to go make the film. I think you had something different in mind than what you ended up yeah. with. No, I I definitely had no idea what I'd gotten myself into. <laughs> um, I, I first uh, stumbled upon a school at Curry Bay, which is a school that is under um, the larger organization called New Horizons Youth Ministries, which operates out of Indiana. And um, so it's you know an American-run school in the Dominican Republic. And I came across the school uh, a while back when I was in the Dominican on kind of an exchange program. 
And I'd never heard about, you know, these types of schools or camps. I, I was completely unaware of the troubled teen industry. And uh, I stumbled across a school because it was, you know, it was in this tiny town in the mountains, and there were other Americans there. So you, you tend to wonder what the Southern Americans are doing there. And uh, they were staff members from the school, and, and the way that they described the school to me made it sound like it was these, you know, hardened juvenile delinquents who were drug addicts and runaways and, and this type of thing, and that they were all kind of, you know, here at the school to get a second chance and to, you know, I was picturing, like, troubled kids building houses in the Dominican Republic and, yeah. you know, getting therapy. And, and the school was Christian, and I was aware of that. Um, but, you know, my understanding was very much that I had no idea there was anything ominous about the school. And then yeah. a couple of years later, I thought that would make a really cool, short, you know, 20 minute heartwarming documentary about <laughs> these kids from all sorts of backgrounds and what they're going through at the school and what they're learning. Wow. And so I, I got permission actually to, to stay on campus for um, about six weeks in 2006. I went down there once previous to that um, to kind of just get a lay of the land. So I ended up filming on campus for a total of seven weeks, and oh, um, man. As soon as, yeah, as soon as I started doing research into the school, you know, like a simple Google search, it became immediately apparent that this was not the type of school I originally thought it was when I got permission to film there, and of course I discovered um, Julia Shear's book, Jesus Land, uh, which a good part of that memoir is about her and her brother's experiences at Escuela Caribe in the 80s, and um, I talked to Julia, and I talked to many, many, many former students before I even got down there, and, and the stories were all very consistent, um, talking about physical and emotional abuse they experienced there. So when, when we finally got down in the Dominican, the film, I wanted to give the school the benefit of the doubt and that I wanted to be as objective as possible and, and see if these things were still happening there, mm -hmm. um, but with the awareness that I talked to many, many people that all, you know, had had really negative experiences there. I, you know, it didn't, it didn't take me long being there to realize that the school had not really changed since, you know, even Julia, you know, wow. since Julia was there and she wrote her book, that there are many, you know, the, the basic structure of the program has basically not changed in the 40 years the school existed, and, and many of the same abuses were still happening when we were filming there. Wow. Has it been 40 years in the Dominican Republic? Um, Escuela Cribe very first started in Haiti. Um, I think they were there for a, a couple years, don't quote me on that. I know they started in Haiti and then um, moved over to the Dominican because of civil unrest in Haiti, which is common. Right. And, uh, and then they opened up another school in Indiana after Escuela Cribe and then a camp in Canada, but I'm, I don't know what the exact years of those two schools. Wow. Yeah, so you thought you were going to do a heartwarming film, then you do a Google search, and you're like, oh my gosh. And did you have a moment of, like, not wanting to do it? Because it was, like, going to open some can of worms, or, or um, were you... I mean, I, w I would never say that I doubted that I wanted to embark upon the project, because we had such a unique opportunity to be able to film inside yeah. the school, yeah. that we knew that that was really kind of a precious opportunity that not many people were you know, if anyone was going to get this permission again. And, and in my mind, if these abuses were indeed going on, then I almost had a duty to go and, and capture it as best I could. Yeah. Um, and I, I think the fact that I started this as a film student, so, you know, I was young, I was a, a female, and this place is profoundly sexist, as many of the programs are. And uh, so I think I had a real advantage in kind of who I was at the time in right. being able to get permission to film there. So, uh, which, of course, you know, was wasn't my intent to deceive them. I really was a you know, young female film student. And, um, but, you know, so we had a unique opportunity. And, no, I don't, I don't think I ever really questioned whether we wanted to do it. It became much yeah. more difficult than I anticipated. But um, we yeah. were incredibly lucky to be able to film there. Well, have you... Um, well, like, once they got wind that you actually did this expose or are working on it, have you... Have you had contact with the school? Have they contacted you? Um, they haven't contacted me recently. Um, basically, to make, to make a long story short, and not to give away too much about what happens in the film, uh, the school did find out that I wasn't exactly their biggest fan. And um, actually, that's kind of all part of the story that will be in the film. But when, when they found out that I wasn't... Um, that I wasn't in support of all their therapeutic tactics, they basically 
you know, it's kind of all or nothing. I got emails from them basically claiming that, okay, you had an agenda to make a bunch of money off of smearing our good Christian names through the mud, which, you know, I'd love to see all this money they think I'm making. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, you know, for the record, no, no one's had to take a paycheck on this thing yet, so. Yeah. Um, you know, and it was very much, you know, it was, you're with us or against us, and, and I was, you know, to them, I was clearly against them 100%, even though I, I, in my heart, I know that I gave them as many chances as I could in good conscience give them to, to show me that they weren't abusing kids at all, you know, and that they were still operating in a very abusive manner, so I didn't, you know. Yeah. What was happening. Yeah. There's that. There's a quote on the Fornets website of uh, one of the staff people there who talk about using the uh, culture shock therapy or something like that. And they and in your trailer they mention how, or one of the staff people uh, mentions how it makes people malleable. And um, yeah. man, I just couldn't believe it. it was like straight out of the horse's mouth. You know, it's like the perfect synopsis of what people call brainwashing, and yeah. and it came directly from the people who are proclaiming it as this uh, wonderful. Well, yeah, and they, they list you know culture shock on their website as you know one of their therapeutic methods, and it's you know anyone that knows they call you know culture shock therapy is not a real therapy that has been you know tested and, <laughs> and used and proven to be helpful or at least not harmful. Um, and it really is, you know, slapping the word therapy on it. It's just a, kind of a nice, it's a nice word for behavior modification, and some might call it brainwashing. You know, they take these students, um, many of them, you know, kind of violently out of the home by having people, you know, take them in restraints without their warning about how the kids down there were, were taken in that manner. And, and they're yeah. drawn into an environment that is completely 100% different from where they, you know, where they were before, different food, different environment. I mean, from every, every expectation that they were used to back home is totally different. Even all the language that they use, um, not necessarily English for Spanish, but, you know, language for how you are allowed to talk about things. There's a lot of things you're not allowed to say. There's specific words you have to use to convey specific things that aren't, you know, in your normal English vernacular. And, and all this, you know, is, and they, and they say it, is really designed to break the student down so that they can build them back up into a, quote, healthy Christian adult. Um, but this is just not, you know, regardless of religion, that's not an acceptable therapy model. You know, yeah. that's not, it's not healthy. No, it's, it's like, it, that, what you just described, it's almost like they took the uh, Robert J. Lifton synopsis of communist brainwashing and they just kind of went down the list and said, okay, well, we can control the language, you know, we'll do this and yeah. we'll control the, uh, I mean, I'm going to, I just found this paragraph and it's a quote and I don't know who the staff member is or you don't know where this quote came from. It says, yeah. Culture shock is a form of psychological disorientation produced yeah. by a sudden and complete change in one's cultural environment. It tends to make adolescents remarkably more dependent upon our Christian staff for direction and emotional support, while also rendering them more malleable and capable of new perspectives. Culture shock in a highly structured setting greatly enhances meaningful communication, offering young people extraordinary occasions for making enriching discoveries that inspire personal growth. I mean, it's so like... Direct that's direct their website, actually. That's oh directly my from like, their marketing material. Mm -hmm. that's, that's just amazing. It's like that's the most perfect synopsis of brainwashing I've ever heard. I mean, you've got the assault upon identity, You've got the mm -hmm. captive bonding. You've got the regression, the regressive emotional techniques. You've got the uh, coerced identification with the abusers, the internalization of the doctrine. I mean, it's just... Yeah. <sighs> it, no, it's, it's, it's uncanny. Um, yeah. I mean, the very first thing that, that I noticed or that I think anyone would notice as an outsider at the school is that... Um, the students are in a strict level system from level zero through level five. And, uh, I mean, literally anything and everything they do or, you know, think or say 
during the day um, is giving points from zero through five and, and the summary of these points um, at the end of the day and then at the end of the week and this very complicated system uh, will determine what level they're on. And um, like I said, the level system was so complicated that after six weeks of observing and filming, I barely understood it, you know, as, uh, as an adult who was on there. Yeah. And um, students, I mean, notably students who are on zero or first level, um, I mean, basically, like, my dog has more freedoms than right. these students do. They right. are not even allowed to walk from one room to another without asking permission from their house father. Um, they're not allowed to, you know, start eating. Even if they're given push-ups as a punishment for something, they're not allowed to start or recover without permission. Wow. Um, you know, so it's really just every tiny yeah. bit of control you have, you know, is, is yeah. really just completely taken away. And, and the school would say it's in the name of, you know, these kids who had out of control lives back home and they need structure and discipline. And, and while certainly some teenagers who were, you know, quote, out of control or getting in trouble might need some structure and discipline, this is taking it to so far in the other direction that I would definitely argue that it's more harmful than helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, to take a teenager, because, I mean, in those environments, I mean, it sounds so much like straight, where, like, you know, you are allowed to freely blink your eyes, and you are allowed to yeah. freely breathe, and everything else. That's your whole, about it. Your, yeah, your food, your your bathroom functions, your eating functions, your mm -hmm. speaking, how you sat, your you know, sit up straight, pay attention, like every other thing was absolutely controlled. And like, I mean, when you do when you do that to it, like. You can't even do that to people like Guantanamo legally, I yeah. don't think. I mean, it's well, like... <laughs> I was recently talking to a, a student who was there while we were filming, and uh, he, after he uh, got out of the program, which is there for, I believe, three or four years, he promptly committed a crime and got sent to jail. And he said in his four years he spent in jail, he had way more freedom in prison than he did at the Toilet Bay. Yeah. You know, it's... He had, and you know, and that was after actually being convicted of a crime. Where versus, you know, the majority of the students who are sent to the school Creek they have not been convicted of a crime or outside of the, the system, and they simply just didn't get along with their parents for whatever reason, you know, legitimate or not. Yeah. So it's, it's scary how few, you know, that if a kid was sent to juvie, not that that's a good place for a child by any means, but they would actually have many more protections than they do at these, you know, troubled teen boarding schools and camps. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing how the um, you know the religious schools I think primarily are the ones that um, are doing the whole behavior modification thought reform programs. Primarily, it's religious uh, organizations, and it is really. I mean, I really appreciate how America has rights, you know, and you have religious yeah. freedoms, but the uh, the whole idea of children just not having legal protection, like, you just got to wonder, I mean, where is the research? I mean, I, one, thing I, I, one thing I really want to do before I die, one of my life goals is to do a research, scientific research study of people who've been through these programs and, and actually do the math and look at the science of what happens. Yeah, now that would be fascinating. I would please, and when you do that study, let me know. I want to I wanna know what the outcomes are, because as, as I'm sure you know, um, with Esquila Caribe, and I would imagine many of these programs, they have virtually no outcome studies. Um, you know, Esquila Caribe, as far as I know, um, never did any sort of formal or even informal outcome study, even sending like a, you know, some sort of survey to their former students or, or doing anything where they could even begin to measure the effectiveness of their treatment that they advertise, you know, as being able to help treat drug addiction and, you know, suicidal thoughts and the laundry list of things that parents might want to send their kids to the program for. You know, they'll throw out a lot of anecdotal testimonies, some of which I've read and I know for a fact were written by students while they were at the school. So wow. it's pretty questionable even those, you know, they had some testimonies up where it's like, no, that that student was at the school when they wrote that. Um, and I know that student, and I know that they don't feel that way. And, and it's not that there aren't, you know, there are some students out there that do feel that the program helped them or that they're better off with it. And, you know, and, and that's their opinion. That's valid. But I would, 
I mean, I don't have the numbers because nobody does, but just in my experience talking with students, I would say like 90% of the students I talk to said they have nightmares at night because of this yeah. program. You know, and so yeah. I, would, I would be willing that if they did a study of it, it would, they would find that their treatment is doing more harm than good, or at very least, it's not as effective as treatments that have been studied, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, drug, you know, drug rehab therapies that have been shown to, at very least, not make people worse off than they were in the beginning. You know, yeah. That are, and then they're often seen by professionals that have experience um, in these areas and that have diverse experiences. I mean, I know at Israel Crete, there were a handful of people who worked there that had master's degrees in um, family, uh, marriage, family therapies. I forget the exact name of it, but um, no one had a PhD uh, in uh, psychology or child development or anything when I was there. And those that actually were licensed therapists had really only worked at a school like Korea Day except for one or two. So they really didn't have a diverse experience or anyone outside of that world to say, hey, actually in the States, this is illegal. You know, yeah. putting a, a student in isolation for weeks on end with only a bucket to go to the bathroom in is not legal in the States and for good reason. You know, right. like hitting students <laughs> with a paddle is not good therapy. And it's not legal in the states for many for good reasons. You know, it's it's not just an opinion, and it's not a religious versus non-religious thing. It's just the facts that we've been able to find out through you know years of research and psychology and psychiatry, and we know these things just don't work. It's not a matter of whether you believe them to be right or wrong. It's, they're just not accepted. Yeah. When I yeah, as far as the efficacy, like, do they even work? I mean, it's it's like. Sure, I mean, there's anecdotal evidence that it's harmful. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. um, but then, well, when I talked to George Miller's office about the legislation that would, you know, federally uh, regulate behavior modification industry, I said, well, how can you regulate an unproven modality of treatment? I mean, nobody even knows. Yeah. If this, if this works, like the Surgeon General's report of, I think, 2000 said, uh, you know, there are no efficacy studies of, of, this, of this methodology of residential treatment in general. It's like, yeah. uh, I, and I was like, well, how, you know, how can you try to regulate it? And they said um, they, they can't outlaw anything until there is scientific proof that it's not, you know, it doesn't work and it's harmful. And I mean, yeah, it's uh, it's amazing. So we really need those studies to show that it is harmful, which seems ironic that it has to be proven harmful, not proven helpful, first. But yeah, so there really is a real need to get studies done to show that this is harmful. Yeah, yeah, it's um, yeah, it's just um. So are you? You, you said like 90% of the people you talk to have like nightmares about the program. Are you in touch with a lot of former clients? And, um, uh, in, yeah, I'm, I'm in touch with, with many, many former students. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I've talked to, you know, the majority of the people that have left the program. It's hard to say. Um, I am in close touch with um, many of the people that started the alumni website, which has gathered uh, several stories of alumni of all three of the New Horizons programs and documented the abuse that they themselves suffered and witnessed. And, um, you know, it's, I don't, I'll be the first to admit that I don't have exact numbers on anything because nobody does. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and there's no real way for, as much as I would love to talk to every single alumni of this program to see what their experience was. Um, I don't have access to that information. So, um, yeah. you know, but I would just say, and again, you know, my evidence is just as anecdotal as theirs, but I would say that, especially in the beginning of researching this, I truly, really wanted to find, you know, to be as balanced as I possibly could. And I right. sought out, um, I really sought out to find alumni that did have good experiences there. Um, you know, I'm sure the school would argue otherwise, but to this day, I still haven't talked to anyone that doesn't have any complaints. You know, I've talked to a few students that would say, okay, maybe it really helped me. And, and by a few, I literally mean 30 um, at this point, yeah. you know, yeah. that, have, that would say it helped them in some ways. But then they would all say, well, but also it was degrading to be on zero level. And yeah, getting squats on the butt wasn't 
helpful. You know, so even yeah. I, I haven't talked to anyone that really was like a hundred percent. You know, everything that was going on there was great and it helped me. And and you know, and, I, and there's something to be said about um, going through a really traumatic experience and needing to find reason for it and needing to say, well, this was really hard, but it helped me. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm not writing off yeah. those students' experiences by any means, but at the same time, when I hear someone say, you know, it really helped me to get swaps on the ass, and it really helped me to, you know, have to ask to go from one room to another. You have to, you know, look at the big picture and wonder if, you know, if it wasn't really that helpful. If they're just... Um, yeah. thankful that they made changes as a result of being sent to the program, but that maybe those changes could have been made through other means, through different types of therapy that are less harmful. Yeah. I think a lot of, I think a lot of, um, a lot of, there's a lot of influence, I think, you know, because in the public's mind, these are, you know, these boarding schools, reform schools, these drug rehabs, it's like, it's all in the name of help. And so yeah. it's like framed in society of like, you know, you tell your grandmother, oh, you know, I went to this place and, you know, in her mind, in your grandmother's mind, well, it really helped, you know, so-and-so, yeah. or that was the, the point of it. And, and in general, we have this, you know, Here, assumption like Earth. There's, there must be something legitimate to it, you know, because it's uh, yeah. framed as beneficial, you know. And, um, well, I think, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no. Well, I just think that affects people when they get out, and like you were saying, you have a traumatic memory, you want to be able to find something good in it, you know? Yeah. And, um, well, and if you think about it, the kids that are sent there are so young. I mean, they're so, you know, 14, 15, 16. It's, it's a yeah. lot for a kid that age to take in and to understand, and I think yeah. many of them believe that they deserve to be sent there. You yeah. Know? And, and, if it, and if a kid had, you know, it takes me questionable behaviors beforehand, like let's say, you know, there's some kids that had dabbled in, you know, more hard drugs, not great decisions, I can understand the parents being worried, well, when they go down to the school and obviously they can't do drugs and they come back home and maybe they decide not to keep doing drugs, you know, and, and so now it's like, well, I don't do drugs because of this program. Well, mm -hmm. maybe that was a positive side effect, but it's kind of like, you know, to me, I look at it, maybe it's an extreme example, but let's say someone gets cancer and they learn some profound, you know, thing about their life through having cancer and they change their life in meaningful ways. Does that mean cancer is a good thing? No. <laughs> it means that they were able to learn something good from this positive or, you know, from this negative thing in their life. So, you know, again, right. and I don't want to belittle people who say, you know, that they, that they had good experience in these places, that they, they learned something from it, but at the same time, I... I don't think that the behavior of the school, many like it, can be justified by saying that there are some good results. You know, some people just go from being 15 to 18 and they mature out of a lot of the, you right. know, the juvenile behaviors they had, and then the school didn't need to be brought into the picture. They just needed to grow up a little bit. So. Yeah, yeah, it's sort of like uh, one survivor I know from Straight. He said, "Well, yeah, what's the acceptable casualty rate?" I mean. If yeah, even if yeah. even if twenty five percent of these people are helped, or even if it's fifty percent, or even if it's a huge amount, claim that it helped. But if you have you know ten percent go out and commit suicide afterwards, or even if one percent yeah. do, or if even if like you know a small percentage end up psychologically damaged from something yeah. that's supposed to help, I mean. Yeah, who's going to determine the acceptable casualty rate? And the, the thing is, with, with minors and with kids in this industry, that question's not even on the table. You know, like yeah. what... Well, they don't even are, bother studying it. The schools don't even yeah. bother looking at it. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure when they do, like, cancer treatment studies, like, you know, there's treatments that are just not acceptable by the... Uh, the AMA because there's you know one percent have a bad Too side big of effect. Risk. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like that question is not even on the table. I mean, it's. Yeah, I'm and stuck. and the fact that so many. I mean, I can't even count. You know, I've how many students of of this school and similar schools have talked to that consistently have nightmares about this place. You know, even 10, 15, 20 years after the fact. And I mean. The reality is, is no therapy should ever give you nightmares for 20 years. I mean, that's yeah. just, like, that yeah. should not be a result of something that's supposed to be therapeutic. Um, yeah. and, and it's a classic sign of post-traumatic stress. And I mean, I've, 
I barely can think of anyone I've talked to about about the school that doesn't report having nightmares. I'm sure there are a few out there, but it's extremely sure. consistent that they have nightmares about being sent there um, and not being able to escape. And it's perfectly understandable because you're you're pulled out of a what for the most part is probably a fairly safe environment back you know at home, and and you're put in this place that you have no control over anything, and you never know when you're going to go home. And that's just really psychologically damaging. It would be for anyone, um, but for a teenager, I think it's even more so. Yeah, that's, you know, one thing um, my therapist said is, you know, with the POWs in the communist brainwashing camps, uh, they, they had this memory of home to cling on to and to hold in their hearts. They knew that people back home missed them and wanted them to be released from their prisons. And these kids in these programs, they've been usually put there by their families and their yeah. families want them to be in there and essentially want them to be experiencing these treatments. And so they don't even have, kids in these programs don't even have that memory of home to hold inside them. As this yeah. uh, anchor, it's like you don't even have that to hold on to. And, um, well, I mean, it, that brings up, I think, two really interesting things for me when I think about the process of making this film. Um, one is that um, I think some of the kids that were maybe, you know, better kids or, you know, not, not really troubled kids to begin with, which was a lot of the students that, that had really not done anything, you know, quote-unquote bad um, that most people think you need to be sent to a reform school for. In my experience, I think those kids almost seem to have a harder time because they really had to figure out, like, what did I do wrong that my parents would want me to be treated this way? Yeah. Um, and then some students, you know, made up stories about drugs they did back home and whatnot just because they needed to tell someone a story about why they got sent there because no one, if you say, I don't know why I got sent here or I was sent here because, uh, you know, I didn't feel longer time or our main character, David, who believes he was sent there because he was gay. Um, you know, it, it doesn't, it just doesn't add up that you would be in this place where you're being treated badly for something that you, you just don't think you right. did anything wrong. Um, right. And, I, you know, I think that that's something that really can cause some long-term damage. And, and it's not acceptable at the school to, you know, for you to really, it's not like a possibility that your parents made a mistake sending you there. You know, it's, yeah. it's never acknowledged that maybe you weren't right for a reform program or maybe really your parents had the issues with you and, and not the other way around. And, and then the other point um, that it made me think of is that our main character, David, again, we sent down there for being gay. Um, I remember, you know, the whole time we were there, the thing that really seemed to hurt him the most was that he had no way to communicate with anyone back home. So nobody knew what had happened to him because he had been taken in the middle of the night and uh, had no idea where he's going, no way of telling the woman back home what had happened to him. And, you know, for him, the... the knowing that his community didn't know what happened to him was just so distressful for him and not being able to communicate where right. he was, anything. And yeah. then again, it's like, I can say this to every famous field that he does, I don't see the therapeutic value in that. I understand yeah. that, you know, if a kid's a drug dealer back home, sure, they probably shouldn't, like, talk to their drug dealer friends on a regular basis. But to not allow a teenager to simply tell their their friends and, you know, their family members where they are just seems unnecessarily cruel. Cool. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah. As people find out in the film, people did in David's town find out where he was, and, and they sprung to action to try to help get him out. So. Wow. Yeah. There's yeah. There's no absolutely no therapeutic value in that. The value yeah. in that is the uh, the proof that the program has that your past identity has to die, and that yeah. where you are now is absolute reality, and this is. Who you are going to become. It's like uh, this clean break with with not just your past friends, but your past identity. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, and it and it makes the students completely dependent upon the staff. And uh, I was talking to one former student, um, Deirdre Suchi, who's actually uh, in the process of writing a book about her experiences there. Um, I remember her talking about when she was at a school like Free Bay, there were a couple of incidences of sexual abuse that happened, um, one or two of which she witnessed. And she was so at that point kind of, you know, I don't know if I want to use the word brainwashed, but she was so affected by the program that 
even though she witnessed two incidences of sexual abuse going on there, she didn't say anything to anyone because the house father had perpetrated the abuse and she'd been told so many times that the house father is always right. So it's like, well, yeah. if he's abusing someone, this couldn't be wrong, even though in the normal world, in my rational mind, I know this is wrong. Yeah. And, um, you know, so like that's how warped, you know, just even her mind had gone, that it was things that would normally set off huge alarm bells. Just, yeah. like, well, this couldn't be wrong because the staff can't do anything wrong. Yeah. Um, I remember while we were filming, uh, like I think I mentioned before that there's a lot of new language that they use to describe things. And um, one of the things uh, that I kept hearing the students say was, um, may I make you aware of, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, may I make you aware that um, my dish has a crack in it? You know, and it was, it was never like, I'm just going to tell you this thing that is a fact that is verifiable in front of me. As soon as I said to say, may I make you aware? I thought that was because uh, in the program's um, you know, way of doing things, you're never allowed, the students are never allowed to tell a staff member what is and isn't quote unquote reality. You know, uh, reality, whether it's a way you feel or something that's happening or like it's something completely verifiable like the sky is blue. You know, so I remember one student explaining this to me saying, well, okay, if my shampoo is empty, and I went to my house father and I said, may I make you aware that my shampoo is empty? I need a new one. And he said, no, your shampoo is full. Then your shampoo is full. You know, oh. it's, it's, uh, and, and it, you know, that's just so profoundly not okay. You know? Excuse so me, so me so not when I heard that. Uh, Excuse me, folks. We did have a call in Georgia from Area Code 301. Okay, that would be, that would be Andrew Pinsner. Hey, Andrew, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Good. Um, um, have you been listening to the show? I'm Kate, Kate Logan, of uh, the director of Kidnap for Christ, um, has been talking. Um, you had a chance to listen in for a little bit. It was great. Oh, good. Um, well, um, Kate, I want to. One thing I want to ask you. I know um, you are trying to raise money to get your film. Uh, finalized and get it distributed, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And do you you have a website people could go to to see the trailer and find out about the film? Yeah, people can go to kidnappedforchrist.com, and uh, right on the front page there we have a link to our Indiegogo uh, fundraising campaign, and you can see how much we've raised so far and. Um, all of our donations are tax deductible through the International Documentary Association, so uh, uh, people can write it on up. But yes, yeah, kingnetforchrist.com, you can view the trailer, make a donation, and read more about the film and get in contact with us if you have any other questions. Uh, yeah, the trailer just blew my mind when um, I saw that you have footage of being inside the program. I just, that just Yeah, we, we have mind. about nine, 90 hours of footage inside the school. Wow. And we're very wow. excited to be able to be, you know, get the funds together so we can get a, a fantastic editor that can help us really shape it into a powerful story. Wow. And that's the goal. Wow. Well, um, I can't wait to meet you in person out there at the uh, SIA convention. And, yeah, um, thank you. And um, my next guest, Andrew Pinsner, he's the... Um, are you assistant director, Andrew? Is that your official title? No, no, no. Chris and I are co-directors. Oh, you're co-director. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, Andrew is um, co-director of the film um, Surviving Straight, Inc. So, um, and he'll be at the CA convention, so you guys will get to meet, too. Um, Kate, thanks so much for coming on to the show. And, uh, yeah, thank you. Really appreciate your time, and um, yeah, I can't wait to, to see your film. Yeah, I, I can't wait till it's finished. <laughs> and for those well, of you that for those of you that just listened, I should say the name of the film is Kidnapped for Christ, and it's about Escuela Caribe. And uh, the website is kidnappedforchrist.com. Yep. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you, Kate. Bye. Bye. Right, well, I should have Chris on here with me. Are you, Chris, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Hey there, Marcus. All right. We got everybody here. All right. 
I, I heard that you had to take I was I didn't know for sure you'd be able to get off work, Chris. I'm so glad you got to come on the show too. Yeah, I'm. I'm really. It's been so fun. Um, it's a. It's a radio show dedicated to uh, films about the troubled teen industry. And um, so, let me introduce you guys. This is Andrew Pinsner and Chris Sarosa. They are co-directors of the film Surviving Straight Incorporated, Surviving Straight Inc. And um, um, I. I have met these two in person, and they're great friends, and they're great people. And um, I'm going to get to go out and see them in about a week and a, a week and a half, going out to the SIA convention, and they will also be at the convention. Uh, another reason to come out there. And um, well, this is a very organic radio show. There's mm -hmm. nothing uh, rehearsed. <laughs> um, and I guess, I guess my question is, uh, what do y'all? What do you what do you all want to talk about? What do you what um what is the most striking thing about working on this film? Or I don't know how you're supposed to do a, a radio show, but what do you guys think? <laughs> well, uh, first of all, I'm very happy to be a part of this project. I think that you know I was so undereducated on the fact that this was an issue in America that it has opened my eyes to a lot of. A lot of the things that are going on, not just with straight corporate in the 80s, but even furthermore today, and it definitely made me like a lot more aware and a, a hopefully a better citizen by becoming aware of these issues. Because if you were to ask me five years ago or two years ago whether or not I thought somebody could possibly be brainwashed on American soil, I would tell you without a doubt no. Mm -hmm. That the, the patriotism instilled in me makes me believe that being in American borders, you're safe. But hearing the stories, it's invariably true that brainwashing techniques are being used on adolescents and being called therapy. And that just shocked me to a degree that I felt, you know, needed the dedication of a lot of people's time, energy, and effort to make more people aware about this issue. Mm. Yeah. I couldn't agree more with Andrew about that, too. It, it's very much a situation where a lot of people have the material. I mean, all the information out there on the Internet, movies are being made about it, this radio show and others. It's just a shocking to actually realize that no one has really heard about any of these or believes that yeah. they exist. When you approach people who talk about the film and want to know more about it, they, their first question is, how did I not know about this? And especially in today's kind of political climate and the election coming up, these are issues that need to be brought to the surface and people need to be more than aware of not only the people that they would be electing, but the people's past and what they've done in their past and who they've worked with. This is something that they yeah. can't stay dormant for so long. Thousands and thousands of lives have been affected. So many kids have taken their own lives. Uh, yeah. Because it's something that nobody believes actually happens. And yeah. the scariest part of this whole scenario is that could have been me. Yeah. And then yeah. Been, you, know, thousands, you know, hundreds of people I know, because just because their parents were a little hesitant or scared that, you know, a child was going into uh, a drug using path in life. But to take such extreme measures to such young children is just so scary to me. I mean, really, that could have been me, and that frightens me. And I feel the need to make other families aware of this issue so that they don't put their kids in these places, that, you know, these places won't be needed or called for or available anymore because of how aggressive they are and how torturous they can become. Yeah. Yeah, what... what? I think Go ahead. A huge part of the sad thing is a lot of people aren't getting help now. I mean, these places have destroyed so many lives while the kids were there, and now just looking back years later, maybe 20 years later, 30 years later, it's affected people's lives so much. A lot of people can't function in their daily life. A lot of people have post-traumatic stress disorder, and psychologists need to be aware as well. They need to be educated that these people are being coercively... They're basically getting close to thought reform done to them, and they don't know it. And as a kid, again, and I think, Marcus, uh, you've made this point before, when you're a kid, you don't know what abuse is. I mean, there, there might be that small feeling inside you that you realize something's different or something's wrong or something shouldn't be happening, but when you're under the control of such a large group or even just someone who's a child who's in charge of you, mm -hmm. you, you kind of lose perception of reality. 
you lose the ability to decide what's okay and what's not okay, especially when you're being exposed to this at such a young age. And most yeah. of those kids, I mean, to forbid the kids these days are exposed to what those kids were, but I mean, again, sexual experiences, drug use, all these things, kids didn't even know what most of the kids were talking about when they were in these programs. So it's a very challenging thing to face, but that's yeah yeah um you know what you were talking about with the election coming up and i have i have kind of intentionally avoided the whole mitt romney subject because it's just like just google mitt romney uh torture for teens or what do you got uh what is that there's an article that maya salvas wrote years ago just Google Mitt Romney and uh, teen torture abuse or something like that. I mean, I don't even want to go there. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't blame you. I don't blame you. Um, well, I know one thing I think people would want to hear about is where's the movie at? Um, I think um, I'd like to hear, like, what if I would think that you know, like survivor, straight survivors who've seen um, one of the rough cuts, everybody's wanting to know, well, when's the movie coming out and what stage is it at? So um, as much as you guys feel comfortable giving people an update of what to expect and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, the cut that people have seen in the past was a collection of footage that Chris and I and our and Katie Schoons and our team, or killer team of filmmakers have collected over the last, you know, 10 months. And what we put together was essentially a process of us discovering the storyline because honestly, when we got involved with making this documentary, we didn't know how, to what extent, the problem lies. And what we've discovered since then is that this documentary is a lot bigger than what we originally anticipated. And so yeah. the stuff that you were previously mentioning is actually going to change pretty radically over the next couple of months because of the data that we're getting and all the feedback we're getting from all the survivors and all the opportunity we have to get some of the interviews that we never had an opportunity to get before because we're now you know, so much more involved with the, the issue. Uh-huh. And so I would expect a radical change from what people had seen, the few of those who did, to what's coming out to be, you know, much more inclusive and, and you know, a much better cut. Um, we're not going to be ready for another couple of months. I think a safe bet would be at the end of summer we'll be completely finished uh, and be able to get another, another screening together. But uh, until then, what we're really doing is we're really trying to make this film the best we can with all the resources that we've been gaining over, over the last couple of months. And those yeah. resources have just been coming in with people trying to donate their time or their insight in helping us create a documentary that really encompasses all of the, you know, difficult issues that we present, which is, yeah. you know, child torture, the, uh, the, the issue with putting people against their will into drug and alcohol rehab centers, the effects it has in the long term on, on people's lives, you know, these are all very in-depth uh, topics that we're trying to cover, and we're doing our best to cover them in a very fair and well-researched way. And so that's where the time is being spent, and that those are the improvements to be made. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's such a big story, and um, sometimes I chuckle just thinking like, and this is what Kate Logan was just saying. It's like she didn't know what she was signing up for. It's like once you. Uh, you know, start looking into that rabbit hole, it goes so deep, and um, it's such a challenge trying to, you know, um, organize it into just a cohesive story, you know. Absolutely, absolutely, and the thing is, is that we were unaware uh, when we started about how much, you know, how big this issue really is. And our goal is to give everybody that we've interviewed a chance to, to tell their story and to tell it right, because we don't want this documentary to fall on deaf ears. We want it to be, you know, watchable to the sense that everybody can, can understand why this is an issue. 
And our hope is to prevent at least one kid from being put into a place like that in the future and to get someone else to be able to understand why this affects so many people today and, and what we can do about it. And that's, that's the important thing. And as we are discovering these things, we're putting them into the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I want to say um, for all the listeners, we, we did these reenactments um, down in Florida or Chris and Andrew orchestrated them with uh, your co like people that you went to film school with and then a bunch of extras or you know actors from Florida State and I guess there was about a hundred people there in total and it was a weekend and uh, everybody was donating their time and um, you know something that impressed me so much Chris and Andrew was how you guys could orchestrate that many people and I there was not one negative word spoken the whole time and I mean it was like just like such a beautiful orchestra of harmony people putting 100 percent into it hour after hour after hour and it would be like go late into the night filming and then up early in the morning filming and they a lot of these student actors were like, they had exams due on Monday, or they had exams on Monday, or their finals were due, and it was like they were donating this whole weekend to the... It was such a healing experience to see that many people care, you know? And Yeah, and, oh, yeah. we love from all those people. We, we really love working with that group of guys. I'm sorry, just kind of stick it over. And really, you know... Everybody there, what really captured them was, when the initial start of the process, we went to a lot of the acting classes for the kids in the theater program and basically told a straight story, told them the truth about, you know, one kid who was in the program, or could you imagine this place that exists? And most of them, they just couldn't believe it or hadn't heard of it. And that's our age demographic. These are kids who could totally be put into these programs if um, they were so inclined. And so for us, it was really getting that message to them and all of them loved the idea of trying to give validation to all those who have suffered that they just wanted to be there. I mean, when motivating, and I'm sure you've talked about it on the show before, but we had kids who had never heard of motivating, motivating in this warehouse. It was just like this moment that was, I, I, I couldn't imagine straight, and all of a sudden I was getting a glimpse of it. And it was the help of the survivors who sat with the actors, you know. That was one of the most beautiful parts of it to me is that, Survivors would come up to the actors and give them notes or, or, I mean, imagine like 20 years later trying to show someone how to motivate again. And <laughs> to me, that, it took so much courage for the survivors to not only come out and, I guess, in a, in a way relive it, but it was also a beautiful thing for them to kind of get past it and realize that maybe it was just this place and it was just a space, but they could move past that and finally leave that behind, hopefully. Yeah. And it gave a lot of validation to us as filmmakers because we're here we are sitting with a hundred of our of our friends who were calling in favors to get this group out there and we're and they're sitting us they're sitting there telling us, Wow, this is so unreal. Like like there's no way that it happened like that. And on, then on the other side of the room we have all the survivors who are there helping us out and coaching the actors who are saying, Wow, this is so unreal. It happened exactly like that. Yeah. And, yeah. and to be able to create that, you know, be able to create that moment. And then also to say that it, it validated us to say, wow, this place really was crazy. Now I can see it. And now, uh, now this room of actors and people our age can see it. Now we know why we're fighting this fight, why we're taking a stand against this. Because we see how ridiculous it is. We yeah. see how these people treated each other. Yeah. Yeah, for me personally, there was a real sense of like, okay, now somebody really knows the story, I can kind of let go of that. You know, like there's this urge to like be understood and knowing that you guys, it was sort of like you guys have it now. And, um, you know, this sense of really being known was so uh, like a relief, you know. And I, well, I, I think... I, I don't know if this is really true, but I think this movie has been a real unifier in the community of straight survivors. And I don't know if, I, I think it's safe to say that, 
I think it's like it's generated so such a sense of like validation and and uh, a sense of like community um, and that coming together and and people reuniting and you know oh I remember you and and um, and just processing. I think so much of that has been triggered by this film, and um, I don't. I want you guys, you two, to know it's it's been a really huge part of a lot of people's healing. You know, just knowing that this film is happening. And you know what, Marcus? It means so much to hear that, and it also, believe it or not, it's changed our lives in a huge way too. I mean, it's. I feel very much a part of the world more now than ever just because I've been exposed to it more. And a lot of people just don't want to go about their day thinking that these bad things happen. But even right now as we speak, there's one kid somewhere, thousands and thousands of kids somewhere, um, getting the same kind of treatment. And to slowly start that validation process is just another step forward into ending this kind of struggle for families and kids everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's um, it's it's sort of like it's such a big issue and such a big problem. This whole behavioral modification industry, and it's there's some very powerful people in the APA and college professors, and who really feel like this type of treatment is uh, effective. And I think a lot of that is just that they're naive about what really goes on. But there's a there's a big assumption in our society that our big ignorance, and um, you know these films, all you filmmakers that I've had on the show, like this is all a multi gener. I mean, like it's going to take several generations, I think, of really raising public awareness, and that's really more than legislation, more than any law is going to take a public, a general public, really understanding why this treatment is wrong and what really goes on in these programs, you know? Right, and you know, the hardest part about this issue particularly is that there is no doubt in anyone's mind that teens struggle with drug abuse. You know, mm -hmm. in any society that has drugs, there's going to be problems. The question is, what is the proper thing to do about it? And mm -hmm. I, by no stretch of the imagination, could argue that straight or any other program like it is a good way to handle it. I think it's a terrible way to handle it. I think it ruins a lot of more, more people's lives than it saves. But mm -hmm. the, there will always be people who will take radical measures to, to solve a seemingly unsolvable problem. And that's the scary part is, is you know, how far will, are people willing to go in the name of health? And, you know, I think one of the biggest parts that we cover in this documentary is it's not my place personally for us to say what, you know, what's the right treatment, but we have to create the boundaries of bad treatment. And places mm. like Straight Incorporated are bad treatment. And we have mm. to create those boundaries so that people don't make those same mistakes. Mm. What do your guys' parents think of this film? Like, when you tell them what you're working on, like, what, I mean... I'd be curious to know, what are your families, and um, what kind of reactions do you get? Well, as far as my family goes, um, at first it was fear. That was their initial um, kind of response to it. Only because, you know, obviously we don't want to go into the political side of things today, and I understand that. But, you know, the, the, these are making a lot of very true statements, obviously, about some very important people. And, you know, that was the fear for them. And the fear for them was also that, you know, if these people can hurt so many lives and ruin so many children's upbringings that, you know, what else are they capable of? And there's a lot of people who don't want you to know that this story exists, or that other stories like this exist. They want to keep that a secret. And in a way, I think it's one of the biggest untold stories that exist right now. I mean, yeah. I'm not really thinking it. It's nobody knows. And if you ask anybody if they believe, I mean, this doesn't just go for drug rehabilitation centers. This goes for fat camps. This goes for uh, turning gay kids into straight kid camps. You know, yeah. like these things that are yeah. absolutely obscene and infringing on people's rights, but we ignore it. Yeah. And because it just 
like a simple way to fix something. But no one's broken like that. Children who are just being kids or, or people who are trying to figure this, themselves out, I mean, I don't know how other people feel, but high school and middle school, those are such hard times for so many kids. And I feel like a lot of parents forget how hard it was to be that age. And, yeah. you know, and I, I don't think it's a, a matter of blaming the parents or anything like that. I think a lot has to really do with you're scared and you love your kids and you want them to be happy and you feel like you're losing them at some point. Yeah. But that's no that's... reason to send them off to them. Yeah, you just said it really beautifully. Hello? Yeah, oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. We have a delay. Um, it's definitely... I, I can't hear you, Chris. Yeah, there's oh, been... Oh, sorry. Yes, it was definitely, um, there's definitely been something that you can't not think about. You know, one thing I just did want to go back to real briefly was the actors and uh, those group of kids who did the reenactment. You know, it was a 12-hour shoot, and it was in this warehouse space, and obviously they got to rest every now and then, but I remember, you know, one of the actresses in particular, um, she came up and she said, my back hurts like crazy, my body aches, um, I'm exhausted, um, and she started crying, and she was like, this is what they had to do, 12 hours, yeah, 14 hours, for, for weeks and months at a time. And to see a girl who would be, I mean, granted, she could have been in straight had it been at a different time, I mean, just to see the physical pain and the physical agony and the emotional attacks, even though the emotional attacks that we filmed were obviously fabricated, it still has this effect on you psychologically, even when you know it's pretend. And what does that say when you when it's not pretend? You yeah. Know, what, what does that say about your experiences when it is a very real existence? And so seeing that happen just after a day or two is just shocking to me because I couldn't imagine 11, 12-year-old, 13-year-old kids in these programs forced to be doing things that under any other circumstance they normally wouldn't be doing. Yeah. Yeah, I felt so sad. Um, I remember that the actor you're talking about, when she started crying like that, I, I was telling Nick, I had um, this moment of like, man, it's almost wrong to even ask people to act this out. <laughs> um, it was so moving, you know, to uh, see how the actors put themselves into it like that. It was amazing. It was a really amazing thing that we were able to create with those group of actors. There was, like I said, there was nothing but love in creating that. And yeah. I think it translated to a lot of the survivors who were there who were skeptical who, of whether or not we were going to be able to actually pull it off or whether or not they would be comfortable enough to be able to be in the same room and re-experience those things. Yeah. Yeah, it was and definitely... the hope with the documentary is to give people who have never heard of the issue enough of a taste so that you understand that you under, you know you can understand and empathize with what's going on and that you know you can realize how ridiculous it was because that's it may be a recreation but we shot how it was that's really how it was yeah and that's such a unique and rare thing to get and I'm, I'm glad it's a part of the film and you know I'm excited to, to present that with the rest of the interviews and the information that we've uncovered yeah. Yeah. Um, well, do you guys have it? I think we're going to wrap it up here in a few minutes. Do you have any final, any last, anything else that we missed or anything you want uh, to add? I just want to say thank you for having us on here. Please check out our website, which is Surviving Straight Inc. INC for Incorporated, Surviving Straight Inc. The Movie dot com. Um, we're going to be finishing up real soon and, you know, we've got Marcus in the film and I just, I'm, I can't tell you how passionate all the filmmakers are about making this movie and making it uh, something to watch and, you know, how ready we are to put that out in the world and let, let people talk about this issue more because this is an issue that needs to be talked about and I'm glad that there are radio shows happening about it. Yeah. 
Well, thank you, Andrew. I really do want to say thank you as well, Marcus. I mean, this has definitely been life-changing for me in a lot of ways. And uh, really the one thing, the only thing I guess I, I would want to say is I think lines of communication need to constantly stay open as far as, you know, kids and their parents. And granted, I don't have any children, so and I'll be the first to say that I don't know what that's like. But as someone's kid, as anybody's mm. kid, mm -hmm. keeping it open and being able to talk and share with your parents. And I think that's one thing that we're kind of missing. Instead of it being, oh, my child has a problem, let someone else fix them, foster that relationship and cherish it. And I think um, one of the survivors said it best, uh, Meredith uh, Gibbs, she goes, don't push them out of your home because you're pushing them out of your heart. Mm. And I think that really... So, um, yeah, well, thank you again, Marcus. And uh, I hope that everything will go well and we'll see you at the SEA convention. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Chris. And um, I can't wait to see you, I guess, about a week and a half. Um, so excited. Yeah. Yeah, so thanks to you both for being on the show and for all you've done for the film. Um, thank you, Mark. Let's, yeah. Um, you're welcome. Um, yeah, we should also thank Kelly Matthews. Um, she kind of, she pretty much we could uh, we could give her credit for uh, giving birth to the whole film um, and uh, and she's just done so much uh, so much work um, making it happen and um, so um, well yeah and that kind of goes into uh, just in general how many people there are working to raise awareness about this industry and um, I, at one point I, I do uh, my original plan was to have my first show uh, just be kind of the old timers who have been fighting the industry for years and years and years and years and uh, it didn't work out but um, uh, this it really is a grassroots effort, and there's so many people fighting and working so hard. And um, to all of you, uh, we thank you. And um, let's see, Kevin, I know you said there was a little radio clip that was like an advertisement for the SIA convention that's coming up. Do we have time to play that still? Absolutely, yeah. Actually, I had it in the lineup. I was going to play it um, at the transition from okay. from you to the next show uh anyway um yeah because we definitely want to help jody in all her efforts um and just while i have you on the spot uh, marcus i know next week you had committed uh same time to do your your fourth show and then um jody has some interest at some point of doing a show and ricky linder has expressed some interest but we've got to put oh, our we've got to put our heads together uh and see if one of them or anyone else from the cumul uh, you know, cumulative movement um, wants to contribute a show or more, get with yeah. me because we need, we need to solidify the 27th. Well, I mean, and, and again, for anybody that's considering, we don't have to do it on Monday from 5 to 7. We could do it on right. another day, uh, 5 to 7, or we could do it later. We, we're very flexible. I uh, will have a bunch of time still open, so if you can put together two hours to support this effort and donate that time, please email me, um, kevin at masterofmanythings.com, or uh, reach out to me on Skype, uh, or however you want to get a hold of me. I'm all over the place. So uh, <laughs> just find me, okay? <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, I'm there. Uh, everything. So that's good. Good stuff. Awesome show, Marcus. And I did, uh, I think I dummied up for about a minute and a half, two minutes, and forgot to hit record, so the first minute and a half or two may be gone. Um, actually, I turned it on right when you were announcing your second guest of the evening, so I didn't get the announcement of your first guest, but obviously okay. they will get to hear 99% uh, of that. Okay. Um, for anybody that didn't make the show or got here late, by tomorrow morning, probably late tonight, but by tomorrow morning, the link for the MP3 download will be on Mediafire, and 
for all the advocates listening for the and for the people that want to listen in um, but can't access the website, if you have a smartphone that ha is Winamp enabled, um, there is a link you can listen from Winamp as well on your smartphones. So pass that information around. We want to make sure everybody's hearing it. If anybody is in a situation where they want to listen in but all they have is their phone, we can set up the conference call number where people can listen from their phone. Uh, you know, we have that option too. We haven't used it yet, but um, if that we, that's something we can do if we ever have a large group that wants to listen. But uh, you know, to have a bunch of phones on the Skype call would distract. So if they're just going to listen, we can set up that other option to listen through, other than just on the website. But please push us, push push the website. We need to keep right. people coming here. Um, make sure that um, our sponsors are getting seen. You know, um, and if you. If you're thinking about sponsoring the site, look around. There's a bunch of places that say, rent this space. You can put up an I love you, honey, or link to your website, uh, whatever. It's your space. So uh, as long as it's not spammy or questionable, you know. Uh, but we're pretty open here, pretty fair hand. So, Marcus, uh, what what's next week? Next week, I will have the author, Cindy Drew Etler. She will be talking about her soon to be published memoir called Straightling and um, Cindy is a really wonderful person and she is a great writer and uh, so I'm gonna ask her to read excerpts from her book and um, ask her to talk about what uh, you know the, kind of the therapeutic value I guess of writing a memoir and telling a story telling your story I'll also have um, another author who was on my first show, Chris Poole, is going to read a fictional account. And uh, we, we talked about this, it's, and it's rather humorous. And uh, although there's nothing funny about abusive programs, I do think there is sort of a therapeutic value if you can have enough distance from it to laugh. And so Chris has agreed to read his History of Straight, Inco Straight Incorporated was starting in the, in the 1400s, I believe, pre-Columbian Straight Incorporated, even uh, programs in uh, Aztec, Mexico. So uh, that will be uh, one of the highlights of the show for sure. And, uh, I might have another author on there. I might try to get somebody else or, I don't know. So far, those are my two guests. So, yeah, that'll be next Monday, 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern time. Wow. That is awesome. Uh, you've worked really hard to put together some really good shows. Okay, Marcus, uh, I'm going to run, uh, get this commercial up. Uh, Anybody that can make sure you support Sia, make note that Marcus's email is in the Op Liberation chat room on the wall there somewhere. So if you had any questions about today, uh, we didn't have time for calls, but you could always email him if it's uh, you know something heavy and you need to have the question answered. That um, email address is in the Op Liberation room, so check that out. And remember, the Op Liberation chat room is open 24/7, so no matter what the show. People can feel free if they want to bounce ideas on that theme in that chat room and gather there. Uh, please do. You know, bring your friends. Maybe they'll hear something else that they need to hear. Um, so, without further ado, Marcus, we're out of here. We'll see you next Monday, though, at five, same time. Okay. And, thank you, Kevin. Uh, you're more than welcome. And for everybody else, by morning, uh, the link will be out for the MP3. Thanks again, Marcus.